Okay, we're back here after some technical difficulties, hoping that this is resolved and just waiting for Reverend Neil back to arrive. And I'm going to admit him and see if this resolves our sound issues. Usually takes a minute or two. Neil is connecting the audio and wondering if that has worked. Can you hear me? Can I, you hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. Wonderful. We made it, <laughs> Neil. <laughs> well, now you, you commented on, on my, uh, my attire. And the reason I'm dressed this way is if we're going to talk about the Reformed Episcopal Seminary, it was a requirement to wear coat and tie to class. It and was. it's part of the practical education that they gave. Yes. So I dress to uh, express that element of the seminary's history. Having said that, would you open us in prayer? I will be happy to do that. We're going to use the uh, colic for uh, uh, schools and colleges. Join me in prayer. Thou only wise God, our Savior, with whom are all the treasures of heavenly understanding, illuminate all schools and colleges and universities with the light that cometh from above, that those who teach may be taught of thee, and those who learn may be led by thy spirit, and grant that by the increase of knowledge thy truth may be confirmed, and thy glory manifested. Through Jesus Christ, thy living word. Amen. Amen. Good to finally get with you, Neil. <laughs> Last time I, we were together was at Christ Memorial Church in April, May of 2018, just day, a few days before it was literally torn down and was sort of a metaphor for what we've experienced. So I want to just kind of open set the stage for the viewers and if you can tell us your background and family certainly. and presbyterianism and reformed yep. episcopal certainly well i was uh i was actually baptized as a methodist we lived across the street from a very fine methodist church back in the day uh some of the pastors uh i don't think the one that baptized me but the one who followed was a graduate of reformed episcopal seminary so they had a good history of pastors. The church itself had a very rich history. There's a, there was a youth program called Christian Endeavor, which was a worldwide program. And that church had the largest Christian Endeavor society in the world from 1903 to 1930. So it, it had a strong uh, evangelical uh, background. Uh, when I was three, we moved. And a young fellow down the street, we had started going to a Methodist church, which may have taught the gospel then, but certainly does not any longer. Young man down the street about my age, three or four, came down and asked me if I wanted to take a bus to Sunday school. They actually had a city bus that they rented, and I couldn't resist that opportunity, uh, and it went to a Presbyterian church, and uh, it was very it was closer than the Methodist church. The pastor was a graduate of Fuller. Fuller. Uh, he, he, he had memorized more scripture than any man I've ever met, uh, he was a very fine pastor. Uh, Even as much as Bishop Herder? I think more than Bishop Herder, actually. He was amazing. Uh, he had a Bible memory pro program for the young people as we grew up as well. Uh, so he was consistent with that. Uh, he um, uh, just was just a, a great pastor. When uh, Once a year, he would uh, visit all the families in the church, and he always went with a purpose. And one year he visited... Uh, it was just my sister and I. My brother had not been born yet. And he brought along with him a book by uh, a woman. You probably know her. You know her husband for sure by name. Her name was, was Catherine Voss. Wow. And uh, it was the Children's Story Bible. And he suggested that my mother buy a copy and that she read it to us every day. And my mother did. And Catherine Voss laid the foundation for Reformed theology in the stories that she told from the Bible. It's a very good book. From a Reformed perspective, and it certainly set my mind to understand the scriptures in a certain way. 
And of course, I will be uh, grateful uh, for all eternity uh, for that. I have had the opportunity, by the way, to visit Catherine and Gohardus Voss's uh, burial site uh, in north central Pennsylvania. So I was a Presbyterian uh, through uh, all my youth. I got involved in Christian Endeavor. I became the president of the Philadelphia County Christian Endeavor and also the more local branch before that. And it was in that uh, role that I got to know about Reformed Episcopal Seminary because uh, we had their professors, uh, many of them come and speak at uh, different rallies that we had, summer camps that we had, uh, those kinds of things. And I learned very quickly that the men who um, taught there loved Jesus and they loved his word. Now, is and, this the uh, 19? Is this the 19? This would have been in the late 60s, okay. 65, 66, and through the early 70s. Um, and and I, I could see that uh, they also knew how to communicate the gospel. Uh, they they all knew how to preach. So they all communicated very well. But let me jump back just now a second. Uh, it, I, in 1967, uh, the Presbyterians, uh, which I was a member of, my church was conservative, but the Confession of 67 made it impossible for me to pursue ordination as a Presbyterian. So I uh, went to Pittsburgh yes. and joined a rel For the Go viewers... Ahead. Um, who don't have the background, what was the 1967 move with the PCUSA? Well, it was just a very liberal confession of faith that basically, uh, uh, you know, about, it was large, largely about ordaining women, things like that, that they wanted to do. Uh, by that point, which I didn't understand at that point, but I quickly learned the Westminster uh, Confession and, and, and standards had already been watered down by the Presbyterians. Uh, so it just was, uh, I was not ordainable. I, I could not agree or subscribe to almost anything in the Confession of 67. And so I began to look elsewhere. I joined, uh, my wife and I actually went out to Pittsburgh, and we became the first two Philadelphians to be members of the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, we had no congregation here, of course. I did start a Bible study. Uh, and eventually we joined a, a, a church that I had been youth director at uh, that left and joined the PCA. So, but my wife and I were actually the first two, uh, first two members of the PCA who, to live in Philadelphia. Uh, at, the, at the organizational meeting for the Presbytery, I had an Amish farmer's hat and, and we met at Westminster and they wanted to take a collection to start forming things. They had nothing to take the money in. So my hat was literally passed uh, to receive the <laughs> offering for the night. So I've had some really close ties to the PCA in the Philadelphia area and getting it started and being involved in it. And then uh, I was... Uh, so that's I, 1973? Uh, it's 70... Well, it was probably a little bit after 73. It might have been like 75, something like that. Um, and and there's, um, there's an old story about the Presbytery PCA asking Bishop Higgins, I think, if they wanted to join the PCA and Bishop Higgins said, no, we'd like to, we're like you in doctrine, but we have a prayer book and bishops. Is there anything that, to that? And that may be, but I will tell you that the man who was in charge of church development in the Northeastern part of the country was a, was a gentleman, but his nickname was Midge Cooley, and uh, he was an RE grad. So the, the, the RE church, the RE seminary was all over the PCA. Yes. Uh, one of the first, pre one of the first GAs I went to, uh, the communion service was literally taken from the RE book and the guy that led it was an RE grad. Um, I did the same at a Presbyterian church. Meeting. In the Presbyterian church, in the PCA. Yep. Yeah. And I led it at my presbytery. I, I had the opportunity to lead communion and I, I, uh, used the, the RE prayer book. I printed out sections that the people in the congregation would respond to. Of course, we didn't have copies in the church. Uh, and uh, there was not an eyebrow raised. I mean, people came to me and told me how much they appreciated the service and so wow. forth. So, because uh, we're here, we're here talking about prayer books and Presbyterians. So, so there's definitely a legitimate uh, reason to do that. Um, and so I, I joined the PCA. I joined a church in Pittsburgh. There were no churches in Philadelphia. 
Uh, we did attend a Reformed Episcopal Church for a while until I had a car, well, until I had a car accident. No, I guess I had the car accident and we started going there. Before that, we had joined a, a, a RPC uh, ES, Evangelical Synod Church, and had been attending there. And eventually we got back to that uh, church. Uh, but I was back and forth between the REs just in terms of being able to get there physically with a family. We only had one car and it was crushed by a truck and it was their fault, but we were without a car for about eight months. So it just became a difficult time. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, I, uh, my, my secular work, I was a computer programmer. I graduated from seminary in 73 and um, I got a phone call. Pardon? From R.E.S.? I graduated from R.E.S. Uh, they used to allow you to go to, well, they did for most of their history, allow you to go to seminary before you completed college. Right. So I had an associate degree in mechanical engineering. Uh, I felt, uh, you know, from the men I had heard in Christian Endeavor and all that, I had a long time felt a call to the ministry. And so I pursued it at RE, and uh, they asked you a number of questions, but the most important question was, are you, are you willing to judge everything by scripture? And if you said yes to that, you were pretty much guaranteed to be admitted. And if you said no to that, you weren't getting in no matter what. That's just the way it was. Now, um, they had a way of getting rid of students that uh, God didn't want into the ministry, and that was called elementary Greek. Uh, they had something called the doctrine of the last second chance. You could take elementary Greek twice. If you didn't pass it the second time, you were gone. And I can tell you that my junior year, I started with 60 students. We graduated 12, and some of them were from the year before us. So that was the attrition rate uh, with Greek. And, uh, you know, you just had to work hard. I, I got a sixth grade English grammar book because I didn't know what the terms were. I, I'd gone to Philadelphia Public Schools, did not have a good uh, uh, education in English. I mean, I could speak, but uh, but a lot of the parts of speech and all I didn't really understand. So I got a sixth grade grammar book, an English book, and I read that the night before we handled, um, you know, Machen's grammar on the same subject the next day. So I had a clue of what was going on. So I, uh, I got this call from, from Milton Fisher, who was the president of the seminary. And uh, they were on a building campaign. They were moving into a new facility, which is where you attended. And they asked me if I, he asked me, he had always had an interest in me. He asked me if I would come and be his assistant, that he needed help uh, with administrative duties and so forth. And uh, they offered me what uh, my wife and I had pretty much figured out to the penny, a thousand dollars less a year than we needed to live. So of course I took the call. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in, in the 10 years that I worked there, we ended up with about $10,000 in deferred maintenance on the house and things like that. It wasn't all cash debt, but there was definitely debt uh, there. Of course, my parents and her parents helped us a lot through those years. We had four children, two when I started working there and four by the time we were finished. So I had more mouths to feed and so forth. What, Along the way, what, I, I... What I, year I felt, was that? I went to work there in 19... 80, uh, 1979, 79? Okay. Yeah, 79. I went there in 79. And I worked for just about 10 years. So it was about 89 when I left. And, um, 89? Well, well, the, 89. Okay. Yes. So it might have been 87, 87 88. It's, it's, it's somewhere in there. I was there for about 10 years. So I may, maybe I started in, in, uh, in 78 and went to 88, something like that. Um, there, and I joined the Reformed Episcopal Church at that point because I felt that even though I was a candidate uh, in the uh, PCA at that point, um, I joined because I felt as a Presbyterian, I should be under the uh, discipline of the church that I was actually going into churches and speaking and preaching. I didn't have to exhort because I wasn't, they weren't Presbyterian churches. It didn't matter. I could preach. <laughs> So uh, I was in their churches and all that, and I felt, well, if I'm going to represent them and uh, preach in their churches, I should be ordained by them. And so I pursued ordination as a Reformed Episcopalian, and I loved the Reformed Episcopal Church, and I loved all the things that it stood for, so it was not a difficult decision to do that at all. Yeah. Um, 
Now, if you add up all those things, if you add up my Methodist beginning, my Presbyterian middle and end, and my Reformed Episcopal uh, part, that makes me a Metho Presbyterian. <laughs> uh, you don't find many of those, uh, <laughs> but I am one of them. So that's my history. That's uh, that's where I where I went. I did when I left the seminary, uh, which we, we can talk about if you like. But when I left the seminary, uh, God had opened the door for me to have some secular employment, uh, which was a, a, a business working with public speakers. And uh, that that's been a very good experience for me and have been a great opportunity to minister to people through that. Would it be fair to say, big picture, that the Reformed Episcopal Church and Reformed Episcopal Seminary was Protestant, Calvinistic, and Reformed, uh, prayer bookish, of course, were liturgical, evangelical, and anti-Tractarian on the negative side, and anti-Anglo-Catholic but positively reformed. Am I right in that? I would I would say absolutely. Now you understand that it was a uh, it was uh, the seminary especially was uh, open to anybody who could answer the question that they were willing uh, to test all things by scripture. So uh, they actually trained more Baptists than anything, mostly Reformed Baptists, and six out of seven students were not Reformed Episcopalian throughout their history. Uh, many of them were Presbyterian and the Philadelphia Presbytery of uh, what became the PCUSA. Many of the pulpits were manned by, pres by Reformed Episcopal Seminary graduates. Uh, I think an example of the Reformed nature of the school was in the 30s, uh, Gohardus Voss's biblical theology went out of print. And the only place you could get a copy was from Reformed Episcopal Seminary because they mimeographed it, a spirit duplicator, if you will, uh, to uh, make keep it published and uh, to uh, have it as a, a, a text for their own use. When I uh, when I finished my undergraduate degree through Geneva College, one of the courses that Geneva wanted me to take was biblical theology, and I did it through an extension program here in Philadelphia called the Center for Urban Theological Study. I had mostly yes. Westminster Seminary professors as my college professors. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. However, um, the man who was the head of that school, that extension program, knew Reformed Episcopal Seminary very well. And he went to Geneva like three or four times and said, no, you don't understand. Neil Beck studied uh, biblical theology at Reformed Episcopal Seminary. And he kept insisting until finally he said to them, you don't understand. I told you Neil Beck studied a biblical theology at Reformed Episcopal Seminary. What do you want him to teach you? And then they gave me credit for the course. <laughs> so, but that was, a, you know, that's an example of, of the Reformed nature and understanding that they had. Uh, we we used uh, we used Burkhoff as our theology text. Uh, Dr. Rudolph was the son of Bishop Livingston Rudolph, who taught him theology. He was the theology teacher before Dr. Robert Rudolph. And so that goes that goes way, way back into the history of the Reformed Episcopal Seminary. Now, three of the first five presidents of Moody Bible Institute were either Reformed Episcopal or graduates of Reformed Episcopal Seminary. Uh, again, uh, there, there was some mixture, but I, I account for that partially through the fact that when uh, liberal Liberalism really entered the church, you know, in the 30s and on a, on a large scale. We had the Auburn Affirmation, all of that going on. Uh, it got hard uh, to, to have uh, people that you could associate with. And so, um, especially in reform circles, because the Presbyterian Church was going south, in a, you know, in a, in a rush. Um, so they sometimes had to make friends with people that weren't as reformed as they might be. And, uh, you know, friendship can sometimes cause some accommodation, and I think that accounts for some of the uh, people that, you know, we wouldn't say are th were thoroughly reformed. But the faculty was, and, uh, and the text proved it. Um, so there was no question what was taught there. As a matter of fact, uh, some, of the, some of the churches that sent men to RE understood that that was not their particular form of theology, but they taught it so consistently at Reformed Episcopal Seminary 
that those men who sent others felt that they could then counter and explain away uh, the things that they were learning in those fields. But for the benefit of an education that was thoroughly biblical, thoroughly evangelical, uh, to go to a school that uh, emphasized preaching and pastoral uh, training, uh, they were willing to do that, even though uh, there might have been some differences uh, in their in the finer points of their theology. And in, in, back in your day in the 70s, what was the number in the student body? Well, we started the year probably with about 110. Uh, but as I say, you know, you the, the junior class was the big class. The upper classes maybe had uh, 12, 15 students in them because the attrition rate was very high. And and by the way, it was not a financial, it was never a financial matter. When I went to RE, they did not have tuition. They had a general fee. And the general fee, I, I can see that you're sitting down, so I'm glad that you are. The general fee for the entire year was $75. Wow. And they sacrificed, those men sacrificed so that they could provide education and provide educated uh, ministers uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ. So that, that was a real testimony to their devotion and to their commitment to the gospel and to the training of men for the ministry. I, you know, I, I look at RE uh, then, um, and by the way, the school that has a similar name today, I do not consider to be my seminary. Uh, it doesn't have exactly the same name. They do have my records, uh, but I am not an alumnus of that school. Uh, my school, I tell people my school is closed. It doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, and that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. Um, and I forget where I was going with all of that. But in, in any event, uh, uh, oh, uh, I see other seminaries uh, more as graduate schools of theology than as uh, theological seminaries in the historic sense of uh, preparing men for the ministry. RE was totally dedicated to do that, even their schedule. You started like at 8.30 in the morning, you were done at 1.20, and they did that uh, so that you would learn to get your work done in the morning so you would be available for pastoral responsibilities uh, for a, a large portion of the day. And that was, that was a conscious decision for them to do that. Um, the coat and tie, uh, it, it's not always appropriate to wear a coat and tie. They knew that. Uh, but if you thought about what you were going to wear before you went to visit someone or do something, uh, it makes a difference. I know in my secular work, because of RE, I always wore a, whenever I was working on a meeting or a convention, I'd always wear at least a, a sport coat. And when people came into the room, the first person they came to see was me because I had the suit coat on. And uh, they saw that as a responsible person, uh, you know, uh, someone who probably was going to be the, the boss on the job. And then, of course, I'd say, no, you have to go over to the man over there with the holes in his blue jeans. Uh, but along the way, I found out what was going to happen before anybody else did. So that was a good thing. Again, a very practical uh, application of what they did. Dr. Rudolph had a Bible memory program. Yes. Uh, RE uh, Seminary was uh, ridiculed by some people because of that. And it was called the Reformed Episcopal Sunday School by some people. Uh, but those Bible verses jump off the page to this very day when you read them. And uh, they were so important in forming uh, a, a consistent view and understanding of the scriptures. Uh, uh, it, was an, it was a brilliant, brilliant move on his part. Five new verses every week for 16 weeks per semester. For five weeks. Yeah. And right. Two semesters, at, you know, you're doing 180 or so versus a year times three. And I'm with you that those verses memorized jump off the page today. I just used one yesterday talking with someone, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Know that your work in the Lord is not in vain, you know. It's and so many Psalm 58 3, which I think Dr. Rudolph liked. The wicked are estranged from the womb, they go astray as soon as they be born, and all kinds of other verses, too. Speaking but, lies, yep, yeah, speaking lies. 
Wait, you were there for 10 years. Who were some of your professors? Let's not go too far. Well, I, had, I had probably uh, uh, pretty nearly the cream of the crop. Uh, George Handy Wales was gone by the time I came. Oh. He had died. He lived to 103, but he only died a few years before I came. And he was replaced by Milton Fisher. And Milton Fisher was a Presbyterian minister in Ethiopia. He met uh, Halle Selassie. Uh, his, his language skills were were so good he went to Brandeis and he got his doctorate in cognate uh, languages and trying to think of who his mentor was uh, you wouldn't know it if I could think of it but anyhow when he went for his when he went for his trial uh, his mentor said Milton Fisher knows uh, cognate languages as well as I do there's no need for us to question him so they didn't uh, because they respected his mentor so much uh, I think he spoke seven languages and um his, his Ethiopic was so good uh, that uh, they asked, the natives actually asked him to uh, kind of bring it down a level because he was actually, uh, had a higher level of language than they did. So he actually had to uh, learn the, the vernacular a little bit more than, than was probably what he would normally have done. Uh, but he was a great linguist and a great Old Testament professor. So I had him. Um, the dean of the school, the New Testament, one of the New Testament professors was a man by the name of Fred Keener. He was, he had a PhD. Uh, our saying about Fred Keener was that some men were keen, but he was keener. And to this day, Fred Keener is the best <coughs> preacher I have ever heard. Uh, he was just an amazing man. Um, his teaching was very difficult because anything he said was liable to be on the exam, including asides and jokes. Um, so if you were a junior, you might laugh at a joke, but if you were a middler or a senior, you were writing like crazy because you knew it could come up again. Um, so it was, it was, uh, I think the last day of, uh, uh of, uh, uh, Bible geography, the last day we did Paul's journeys and the final, the final was all about Paul's journeys and we only have one class on it, <laughs> you know, just the way he did things. Uh, you studied everything because you didn't know what and you had to study it exhaustively. But uh, so he was Fred Keener. Uh, of course, uh, Bishop Herder, uh, Theophilus John Herder. What a, what a man, what a scholar, uh, what a delightful man. You, you know, because you went there, that grin of his and the twinkle in his eye would just, it was just the most wonderful thing. And uh, he, his teaching style was so thorough. I, 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 I never had a teacher that when I took an exam, I didn't need to see my grade. His exams were so comprehensive in the proper kind of way that I knew what I knew and I knew what I didn't know when I was done the exam. Uh, so he was, a, he was a marvelous teacher and he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, and he, I had a, he had a love for his students too, was my experience. He had a fabulous love for his students. When you, you didn't have them in your senior year. So at the end of your middler year, he and Mrs. Herter had the entire middler class and their spouses for dinner. It was just glorious to spend an evening with him. He had a sense of humor. When I was working at the seminary uh, and preached at a church out near him, he had invited my wife and I and our, our daughters to come uh, for lunch on Sunday after church. And we were sitting outside, and he, he, he had little stepping stones. And one of them had looked like Asian pictorial language on it. And he, you know, he looks at it, and he looks at me, and he says, that was a Chinaman's tombstone. I said, really? I mean, it's Bishop Herder, you know, really? He said, yes. He said, I, I actually had uh, someone from China come in and, and, and translate it for me. Would you like to know what it says? And I said, certainly, I'd love to know what it says. He says, it says one sick duck. <laughs> one sick duck. <laughs> so he had a sense of humor. It was very funny. Uh, a, a fellow student uh, of mine who was not from, uh, well, he's from a Baptist background, maybe even some Mennonite in the past. Uh, he, he didn't, he, he came to love the prayer book. As a matter of fact, he and I did a series on his radio station called Morning Prayer for about five years. Uh, then we both got, uh, you know, a little too involved in other things that were required of us. So we had to stop that. But uh, so he loves the prayer book. He loves liturgical worship. But at that point, it was new to him. And uh, he went to Bishop Herder and he had heard of apostolic succession 
he went to Bishop Herder and he said to him, uh, what's this about apostolic succession? And Bishop Herder got that little grin on his face and a twinkle of an eye. And he says, I don't know what it means, but it's groovy. <laughs> so, uh, he, you know, he just had this wonderful sense of humor. Um, and, I, re uh, I remember in a Greek class, you know, in the midst of parsing and all that goes with that, the thought struck me in his class, what would ever happen to this place if they became Tractarian or Anglo-Catholic? The, the thought was not, I was did not invite the thought into my head. Um, I was not thinking about that. I was thinking about Greek, this, that, and the other, but it struck me. And I it was so stunning at that moment because they weren't Tractarians and they weren't Anglo-Catholic. And you knew that even, and I, I came in from a Presbyterian and reform background. So the whole idea of Tractarians and Anglo-Catholics was novel to me. But I remember that striking moment in Bishop Herder's class, how stunning and invasive even the thought was. And I thought, man, it'd be terrible if they turned their backs on their heritage of 1873 and, and and you know my argument that that began changing in 1990s right well that probably started before that but let me finish my faculty i yeah uh, dr robert knight rudolph was the theology professor his first year of theology was his own course and it was a marvelous introduction to reform theology uh he had uh, a lot of uh, phrasing that he had developed over the year that captured your attention. Uh, I always believed that God created the world in six days out of nothing, uh, but I didn't really fully understand that until Dr. Rudolph said one day that God made everything out of nothing, and nothing is not something. I literally went home and rethought my life that night, uh, because I guess I always saw a pile of nothing that God made something from, but it's nothing. Uh, so that was uh, that showed me, you know, in a sense, a way to understand how big God is, uh, how great he is, how magnificent. Uh, so he had a lot of things like that. And he was a bulldog. He was a loving bulldog. I, I went to him one day. I, my, my, I had gotten married and we were getting my wife's car, which was in her parents' names. And I had to meet my father-in-law uh, after school uh, at a notary to get the paperwork done. And don't you know, that day I had forgotten my wallet. So I I went to Dr. Rudolph and I said, is there any way possible I could leave your class 20 minutes early uh, because I need to go get my wallet um, to meet my father-in-law. It was before cell phones. I had no way of contacting him. He was an elderly gentleman. Uh, and the first thing Dr. Rudolph did was put his hand in his pocket and pull out his wallet to give me money. Oh, wonderful. One. Uh, you know, uh, it wasn't the money I needed. It was my license that I needed. Um, and he did let me go with a lot of regret. He really did not want to let me go. Uh, but he, but I mean, that was his first reaction was this man needs money. I'm going to give him money. There was no question. He just did it. Uh, so what a, a heart of compassion that was, uh, you know, uh, what people might not think if they heard him lecturing uh, dogmatically, which he did. Um, but it was all marvelous. It was all wonderful. It wasn't uh, reading from books or anything. I mean, we we read, uh, but he taught, and uh, he taught wonderfully. It was a wonderful thing. And I did have uh, um, uh, Dwight Zeller, who, who had been a chaplain in the Merchant Marine. Uh, he was there during my years. He did uh, some work with homiletics and some, I guess, uh, church history. I had uh, Howard David Higgins, who was Bishop Higgins. Uh, he was our, our church history professor. Uh, he was probably not the best teacher I've ever had, uh, but his his pious life was so genuine uh, that it was wonderful for future ministers to see his life in action Absolutely. and to and to be able to emulate uh, the way that he carried himself and conducted himself. Uh, for instance, he's the one that taught us never to give money to anyone. Uh, he told us that he had always carried business cards because he had been uh, the pastor in New York at First Church for a while, and uh, First Ari Church of New York. And uh, 
he would carry business cards. And when someone would approach him, uh, he would give them the business card and he had arranged uh, at a, at a, uh, a restaurant, um, not, not a, you know, not a five star, but a place that he would eat at that. If anyone showed up and gave his card, they got a meal. And, uh, and I did the same thing when I worked at the seminary because I took public transportation. I wore a clerical collar. Uh, people were always coming up to me for money and so forth. And I gave them, I had a, a luncheonette that I would eat at. And I made arrangements with them that I would settle at the end of the month anybody that uh, had used the card to get a meal and they could have anything they wanted. Now, that was going to be a burden on me because I didn't have a lot of money, uh, but I was willing to do it. And I gave out, uh, you know, uh, probably 100 cards over the, the years that I worked there, maybe more than that. And uh, no one ever turned them in because they wanted the money for drugs or alcohol. I got you. And, and so the, the worst thing you can do is was to give somebody money. But that was a practical lesson that Bishop Higgins taught us. So you had that. And then there was a guy named Leonard Riches um, who uh, taught uh, junior homiletics. Uh, he taught apologetics. And uh, he never looked at you when he, uh, when he spoke. Uh, he always looked over your head when he was lecturing. And everyone had questions about Leonard Riches. Uh, none of us really thought he was maybe square, maybe just on the mark with the rest of the professors in terms of where his head was. So you, uh, you got always, your, your felt you and your fellow classmates saw that as students. Yes. Yeah. There was just something about him. Uh, the, I don't know if the name Georgie Vins means anything to you. He was the Baptist preacher in Russia that uh, had been in prison for many years and Jimmy Carter got him out of prison or he came over here and started a mission work to Russia. Uh, I had the opportunity to do some computer work for them. And one of the, one of the, I mean, they were very thorough in, in checking me out and they had a picture hanging on the wall uh, and it was a picture of a, a group of Russian ministers uh, uh, at the time of the uh, communist uh, takeover when the czars were thrown out and so forth. And one of the group had turned in the other ministers um, and George e. Vin's father was in that group. And they had me look at the picture and they said, uh, which one was the traitor? And I pointed right to this guy and I said, he was the traitor. And they were amazed that I had picked him out, but you could see it in his eyes. They were not, they were distant. Everybody else was, was focused and his eyes were distant. And there was just something about the way that Riches lectured, you know, he would not look at you. He looked over your head. Uh, there was there's just no no nothing to convince you that he believed what he said because there was no contact like that, and uh, we all we all felt that every one of us. Interesting, interesting. We we too had the same thing in my three years with him. He would bring in Burkoff, prop it in front of him, and read it like a prayer book, with no notes, no discussion. It was cold, and we just didn't get it. Uh, right. We just couldn't connect like you could with Dr. Fisher or Bishop Herder or Dr. Gelzo. He was a little bit later. But listen, right. uh, Neil, w we got to bring it to an end here. I only get 30 minutes <laughs> um, before they start charging me. And are you willing to come back again? Oh, we haven't even cut, broke the ice yet. Of course, okay. I have to come back. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, well, let's... I won't promise a bow tie next time. Well, maybe I'll get a bow. <laughs> maybe I'll put a collar on. I don't know. I'm sitting in my man cave. But let's close with prayer from another collect in the Reformed Episcopal prayer book um, on the same theme of institutions of learning. Let us pray. Almighty God, the author of all being, our only true guide and protector, visit with thy blessing, we pray thee, our church schools and seminaries of learning. Inspire the teachers with a proper sense of their solemn duties and with grace and strength to fulfill them. May our youth be trained up in thy nurture and admonition and plant in their hearts that fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, that faith which worketh by love and overcometh the world. 
Fill their memories with the words of thy law. Open their understandings to the truth as it is in Jesus. So that made wise unto salvation, they may escape the pollutions of error and sin and become strong in thy hands for the maintenance of pure and undefiled religion among men. Grant this for the sake of Jesus Christ, thy son, our savior. Amen. Amen. Gotta, gotta go, brother. We'll be in touch.